Hey, this is John Reed wrapping up another exciting Corona week. Got Brian Summer on the call again. This is our second podcast. The last podcast had what I considered substandard sound quality, which was hilarious because I have a super expensive microphone and Brian's calling in on his headset. Brian sounded awesome. I sounded like crap. Go figure, <laughs> technology. Brian, how you doing, man? Doing just fine. Just fine. So our challenge today is you sent me enough notes on the ERP market for several vendor white papers, and we got to turn that into a, a conversation that people actually want to want to listen to. So it's a good challenge. Yeah, I mean, and we're not going to cover it all. Uh, the podcast will probably end up being a teaser for people to come back to the Diginomica site and read some other articles later on. Ooh, I like the yeah, teaser. Yeah, there's but, you know, to, to that point, I, there is a lot that, if you will, should g be giving ERP vendors and other, you know, enterprise software vendors some cause for serious reflection as to just how relevant are their products in today's business world. Um, I'm not trying to take your intro thunder away from me, but I would, you know, no. the thing that strikes me, strikes me, John, is there have been three major, major, huge recessions in less than 20 years now. The uh, the O in O one when we had the dot com bubble blow up and you know the Y two K stuff come crashing down, then we had the Great Recession in O eight O nine and now we got this thing with this pandemic here in twenty twenty, and if anybody thinks that business is just some slow steady eddy rarely changing kind of static world that's that's gone there that just doesn't exist and yet I you know I'm gonna finger the ERP vendors. Because so many of them built products back in like the 1980s and 90s when there was a more static kind of world in time. And those products really are starting to show some serious cracks uh, with their inability to bend and flex with the times. Yeah. Well, let's uh, check out your notes here because I got a couple comments and a couple things that jumped out at me. Uh, I want to start out with my own observation. Um, you talked about analytics that we ERP vendors must have analytics using external data to access signal chains such as suppliers in one country, slowing down delivery of raw materials, changing GDP rates, things like that. Um, the observation I would make to you is you and I were on a cloud ERP series of analyst calls a couple of weeks ago and on the call, I wouldn't have even known that they had transactional software anymore. They were talking so much about analytics and data and, you know, intelligent decision-making and automated workflows, things like that. It's kind of interesting, right? Like suddenly transactional stuff is, it's almost the kiss of death in positioning. Even though we rely on the transactional systems every day, that's not enough anymore, is it? No, and, you know, I, I I know I was on some of those same calls with you, and, you know, right now for the, for the time being, the planning, forecasting, and budgeting technology products are the darlings of the market at the moment. Uh, they're probably right behind, um, you know, the workforce collaboration and communication tools. And they're, you know, um, one of the major ERP vendors, uh, the CEO of this company, huge firm, he was telling me privately the other day that they went from doing like a once a quarter plan and a readjustment to now they do a two or three plans a week is how many they're doing right now. And that the most overworked piece of technology they have in their firm is their planning and forecasting tool because it's such a dynamic time. So yeah, it's uh, it, there's a reason they all want to talk about uh, that capability. It's because all of a sudden they've really got to use it and they've got to depend on that kind of technology. But, you know, the problem is most of these tools are pointed uh, inwardly. You know, they're looking at their data and they're forecasting things based off of their um, past history and the like, and they're just not pulling in data from outside the organization, and that's the problem. Uh, in fact, that's why, you know, I think these like signal changes, uh, you know, you're going to find out about things, uh, you know, from talk, getting uh, outside data sets 
for example, uh, right now, you, I mean, you've been able, people have been able to buy data, uh, databases that show weekly prescription data uh, uh, from all over the world. And people know what doctors are prescribing. Well, if you'd been looking at that, you could predict, uh, you would have already known that a lot of the business that used to go to drugstores, doctors' business and like is really down, and a lot of like elective surgery is gone. Uh, and you could do a better job of forecasting the financial condition of hospitals, clinics, drugstores, and so forth. But, you know, those things are there. They've been there, you know, for a long, long time. It's just that no enterprise software company seems to know or how to create an offering where they at least put together a template with some of these external databases and signal markers in place so that companies could know, uh-oh, here's a change coming, as opposed to being almost universally surprised, like, wow, we didn't see, the, you know, that impact coming or coming in so hard. Right. I mean, if we've learned anything in the last three months, it's that when you're blind to external data, you're missing a really big piece of the puzzle. And, and, a, and hopefully that finally lights a fire under this because I think you and I have been beating this drum about external data sources. I feel like we talked about that in a podcast like three or four years ago now. So we got this outline of yours in front of you. And in the meantime, I had a couple of interesting events uh, that I did. I, I did a presentation with a bunch of CIO types for a large ERP vendor. And I got a big earful of their complaints, issues, and concerns. And then a few days later, I did a consult with an up-and-coming vendor trying to move up market. And I think what, what's very, very interesting about trying to move up market is that you, you get to confront all the challenges of, of enterprise, right? Like, how does your product scale? How secure is it? All the things that, that you really get put to the test when you go into larger companies. But also a different buying process, a different sales process. Uh, one of our big themes you and I talk about is how sales and marketing, as we've known it, are, is broken. And so for a new player, that does give them the opportunity to, hey, you don't have to learn the old rules because the old rules sucked anyway. So you can start to try some new things. But one of the big things I told them, and let's see how this jives with your notes here, is that when you're talking about, oh, we're a cloud player, a lot of vendors seem to think that that means that you're going to buy all their cloud solutions. But the way customers hear that is we're going to have an interoperable environment. So if I want just to take Salesforce, since it's so prevalent, if I want to use Salesforce for CRM instead of your stuff, I want that to happen. And, and don't come to me and say, we got the APIs for that and leave it in my lap. I want you to make that happen. And I think that's one of the big things when you talk about the new ERP terms and conditions, I would add to the list interoperability. Yeah, I, uh, I don't know what to say other than uh, the problem you describe is a uh, problem of hubris that vendors have had as long as I've been tracking these last couple of decades they all seem to think that everyone is going to buy every bit of their suite and just be elated to have that and somehow that every part of their suite, including the weakest members of it, uh, are going to somehow magically do wonders for clients. And yet that's not the way it works. In fact, I kind of look at software sometimes like a, a person's wardrobe. Yeah, you might have, a, I don't know, let's say uh, you might have a – Pierre Cardin suit, you might have a, um, a Tommy Hilfiger belt, you may have a pair of Bostonian shoes, and I could go on and on. I mean, wardrobes are kind of like the ultimate best of breed in some cases, and it's rare to find somebody who only dresses in Givenchy. Uh, you know, so, um, uh, you know, I, I, I would agree with that, and what clients want or customers want is they – they don't want to buy a bunch of parts and tools. They don't want a driveway covered full of that stuff. They want a gassed up running Porsche in their driveway ready to rock and roll. They want the, the vendors to make the integration not only happen once, but always ensure that it never breaks. Right. And the other thing that I, that I personally have found very entertaining and instructive is – you know, we got this whole push around CX, right? Everyone's talking about customer experience. You, you, mm -hmm. can't, you can't 
go onto a vendor website without learning about all the wonderful things they're doing with CX. Uh, so great. But what I find very interesting is that the way I think customers interpreted that is, wow, you're right. And that means I'm going to judge you based on all my interactions with you. So if you, your software, yeah. might, your, your, your software might be great, but if your pricing sucks or your support sucks, then your customer experience kind of sucks. And I think that's kind of put some vendors on their heels. And this ties right into some stuff from your outline. For example, new ERP terms and conditions, no audits during a recession. How's your customer experience when you're getting audited? Oh, it sucks. Um, and yet, um, you know, in, in one breath, you got vendors telling Wall Street that their earnings are, and I quote, recession proof, uh, end quote. Now, how can they be recession proof when some of their customers are, are in businesses that are effectively shut down? They're, they're not getting revenue. They've laid off 10, 20,000 workers, whatever. The user counts are down. Yet these guys are bragging to Wall Street that they're going to be recession-proof. Well, you know, I tell you what, every one of those earning calls should be something that uh, that uh, software customers are playing back to the vendors going, you guys want to explain this to me? You want to explain how that correlates to great customer experience? When you're bragging to Wall Street, you're going to continue to wallet frack us the whole time we're, you know, knocked down on the mat here. Yeah, that that stuff just doesn't wash with me. I I do find it amazing that an industry that's chock-a-block full of vendors with negative net promoter scores is going to lecture the world on customer experience. I mean, you know, John, if we don't move off of this real quick, I'm going to probably get so wound up we'll have a two-hour WebEx here going on, um, or podcast, excuse me. But yeah, the 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 uh, it, it, it is an appalling problem. No question. Right. But there are some other things, you know, um, uh, I think, I think what this also showed both vendors and customers is that the standard static old school contract that, uh, vendors make customers sign always assumed that customers will slowly, but incrementally grow and license counts will grow and user counts, excuse me, will grow. And they never plan for things to scale down or to be volatile, to scale up and down and maybe back down again, then back up a little bit. They never planned for that. And as a result, there were, never were the kind of uh, flexibility in these things. The force measure uh, terms in the back of the contracts never uh, considered these kinds of issues. And as a result, um, you've got you've got this really bad informal tin cup begging going on between some of the largest customers and ERP vendors trying to get some kind of relief. And the vendors, to your point about customer experience, haven't exactly been um, universally uh, malleable on these points. If they did anything, they may have offered some uh, yeah, we'll give you some temporary relief on paying us immediately, but then you're going to have to pay us a whole lot more next year when you catch up on the cost plus our usurious uh, add-on fees. And by the way, our flexibility now is going to require you to lock in on some additional modules you didn't even want to buy or subscribe to. So yeah, I you know it's we we need a new we need a new economic relationship. We need new contracting terms. We need. We need those kind of documents to be relevant in the dynamic, chaotic business world that exists today, not reflect the artifacts of a world of ERP and enterprise software that existed basically before 2001. Yeah, I just think it's really interesting how be careful which buzzwords you use because they might churn on you. If you push CX, companies, customers might start judging you on their experience with you. If you push cloud, Customers might start demanding interoperability of your solutions with external providers. You know, if you push AI, they might start expecting that your software has intelligent recommendations embedded within it that show you how you benchmark against your peers and then automate processes that are mundane. Um, these are things that when you start flogging these buzzwords, then you, you do raise expectations. Um, but Brian, I think we need to shift gears a little bit because we kind of been hammering away and it might give the users yeah. the impression that you and I are 
are just a couple of cranks uh, who can never be satisfied. Um, but I think the one thing about this business is that when you lose your intellectual curiosity and your ability to be inspired, then you, you might as well retire because you're of no further use. So with that <laughs> said, you've had some interesting things lately that actually impressed you a lot. You want to share a couple of those? Yeah, I just I, I did a call uh, just today with the uh, Symphony Talent Smashfly folks, and it was probably one of the best calls I've heard or participated in uh, for the whole almost first half of this year. Uh, what was really great about it was it was it was focused. It was all about products and product innovations. It was I mean it just started strong right out of the gate, and they. Was it was all about real innovations that they've been working on for the last you know several months, as opposed to something that where like so many of the calls we're on, we're going to have to spend uh, a quarter of the time just uh, talking about wow, these have been some unprecedented times here, wherein even we were surprised, and you know uh, these guys actually, you know I like the vendors that have things that were already designed for a more dynamic world. And those are the vendors and products that are going to do well. Uh, I also think that there are some great vendors out there who have a cost structure and, you know, and I'll, not an endorsement here, but I'll just say it'd be like Zoho that uses a lot of open source and, uh, or their own custom code so that they can instantiate new customers for virtually nothing. And I like those because they have grown, you know, they're able to grow and scale and their solution is more likely to be of value to companies that are going to live in a more dynamic time. Uh, likewise, I think there are some other products that are sitting pretty right now because a they were built entirely on a highly scalable cloud some of which have hyperscaler uh, back ends if they are not running on their own cloud and they can deliver capability up and down and can be much more flexible with customers so the ones that are going to win are not the ones still trying to defend their on-premise private cloud kind of products or hosted solutions the ones that are going to win are the ones who help their customers truly uh, adapt and change at light speed in a dynamic business world. Yeah, it's really cool to run into customers or vendors who are a bit ahead of the curve. I've I've done documented some of those of late. One of my favorites was support.com. Uh, no financial ties or anything like that, but what intrigued me about their story is I got a PR pitch from them, said, hey, we're we're hiring, we're ramping up. I hadn't seen an email like that in a long time. And <laughs> Did they offer you a job? Uh, well, uh, I'm, I'm thinking about it for plan B, to be honest with you, but uh, <laughs> we, uh, we all have to have plan, plan B and plan C, right? I know you're working on, you're brushing up on some of your mainframe programming, so you know we all have something we're working on. <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway, <laughs> but but the cool thing about this business model was so they they had for years they had built out remote uh, service and support because they wanted to be support.com want to be an alternative to the offshore call centers and stuff like that. And then all of a sudden companies are scrambling because their call centers are down. This company is ready to go and can can ramp you up in a matter of weeks. What I said to the CEO is I during the interview I said that's really cool. And one of the things I really like about that is it offers you the possibility of tapping into talent pe talent pools of very deserving individuals who, uh, for whatever reason, can't, you know, uh, work in an office environment. They might be disabled or they might be just excluded. I mean, you've written a ton about this, of how people get excluded from applicant pools. The CEO tells me, yeah, well, I don't actually promote this or make a deal out of it, but a third of our workers, more than a third actually, are, are either veterans or disabled or what have you. Um, they couldn't work from home. Not only that, but he goes on to tell me that not only, you know, I mean, everyone's telling you, oh, we went remote really quickly because we're a cloud vendor anyway. These guys, they not only did they go remote, they had a built-in split shift schedule that all it's all fine-tuned. So, you know, you want to work in the morning for four hours, then clock out, go take care of your kid, go take care of your, your grandmother, come back on later. They have it all sorted. 
like, cause they've been doing it for years and, and you're mm. like, okay, like those are the kind of stories where it's like, yeah, you got ahead of things and now you can make a difference. And then he goes on and tells me about how he's helping competitors solve some of their problems. Like, wait, you're helping your competitors. And what it comes down to is, yeah, you help your competitors right now because if you don't, there won't be a market to return to later. You know, you wor- worry about your market share a little bit later on. Like right now we got to get the, get the economy back. So we're going to help our competitors. I'm like, okay, now we're talking. Like now we have a good discussion. You know, I'm going to go to one of the I'm hearing those remarks. I, I am going to circle back to a vendor you and I have spent a lot of time with um, over the years. That's Plex. And you probably heard, maybe you did or didn't hear me uh, last week. I had asked their their CEO a question about how um, uh, during the Great Recession in 2009 that they picked up some – those were some of the greatest new customer addition years for Plex – because so many uh, tier two, tier three automotive suppliers could not get any price relief from their old school ERP vendors when it came to maintenance. And as a result, and they had aging computer hardware. So here's Plex with an all in cloud multi tenant solution and selling at a price point that was a fraction of what a lot of ERP products were at. And they were able to convert a whole bunch of them, uh, people off of old ERP products to Plex. I tell you this story because I think you're going to see a lot of companies want to go maybe dip their toes slightly down market just a smidge with high growth, pure cloud, highly scalable kind of solutions that can be implemented really fast and really cheap and have very low subscription cost. And the more damaged your vertical is in, like uh, restaurants, the more likely you're going to want to go down market a bit and save some serious money. So I think some of the major vendors are going to be, you know, need to be looking over their shoulder because they're going to be uh, they're going to be attacked by a lot of vendors who have a better cost structure, have a better story, are hungry, have a great implementation capability. And uh, and are going to take a lot of market share away. So there's, you know, these are going to be interesting times, uh, to say the least. And it'll be, you know, the the, re- the ball is really in the court of some of the major established vendors uh, to see whether they are going to choose to play offense or defense. Are they going to try and throw up all kind of like contractual, legal, and other barriers to prevent their customers from jumping ship and seeking true love elsewhere? Or are they going to get play offense and try and come out with better capabilities that work and better contract terms and everything else to make their solutions more relevant for the times that we actually live in today? Absolutely. Then there's one final piece, and Brian, I don't think we can do a full review right now. Maybe we'll do this a little later on in another, in another taping. But we've, we've gotten our ears and eyes full of uh, plenty of virtual events now. Unfortunately, most of them have been either abysmal or, or disappointing. Uh, the, the art of the, vi- the virtual event series I've been writing has not yet been fully taken to heart. But basically, there's just a lot of opportunities that have not been seized by vendors to do more creatively virtually than roll out slides and webinars. Having said that, uh, I think there is an increasing sense of possibility there. And uh, one of my colleagues, Phil Wainwright, um, shared a virtual event. Uh, we have no ties to this company, but uh, it's a company called Guru. He said, uh, two things stood out for me. It was live with lots of opportunities for engagement. It was short, uh, two-hour session, kicking off a number of sessions throughout the summer. Uh, the platform was Hop In. I'll get back to them in a minute, um, which presented very much like a cross between Zoom and On24. Showed the speakers the video panels, very active live chat, which is one of my big things. Don't be afraid of the live chat. Embrace the live chat. Don't worry about the fact that it's potentially detracting from the attention of your main speaker with proactive moderation ads, Phil. The event also used slider for QA, which was properly picked up by the presenters. Imagine that, picking up the questions mm-hmm. during the presentation instead of blathering on. Amazing. Um, and then they addressed the question. Phil went on to say, the first session started with a short CEO intro, then right into a customer interview with Shopify. 
followed by an all-female customer panel. So they avoided the mantle trap there, <laughs> talking hmm. about remote teams, about 500 attendees according to the platform. That's the kind of stuff that to me starts to tap into like what is possible. And, and I think what vendors are going to find is that when they do that, they're going to get a lot better result. And that result is going to be a bunch of stuff. It's going to be an increased sense of community around what they're doing. I think it's going to feel, fuel their sales pipeline. Oh, and by the way, people are going to write about it too. I just talked with an analyst tonight who told me, you know, a lot of these vendors are getting frustrated with me because there's no content coming out of these events. And I'm just trying to tell them, like, I can't write about events where nothing happens. Amen. Let's put a plus 100 next to that statement. Uh, that's been that's been a rather amazing thing to me is the abject lack of news, uh, content, product announcements, whatever. Um, and what little comes out, like I was on one call, they, there were 39 analysts on the call. And uh, the presenters went on for about 45 minutes. And then we were supposed to have Q and A, and I mean, look, folks, there's no way in the world you're going to get uh, 39 questions and answers doled out in the last 15 minutes, um, and particularly when the uh, when the speakers had all used pre-recorded messages, so there really wasn't a live angle to it hardly at all. So yeah, there. The, the stuff is really not well done right now. I get it. People are kind of scrambling, inventing stuff on the fly. But that's why I, I uh, teed up that uh, comment about uh, Symphony Talent and Smashfly today as being one of the best ones I went to because it was all about good stuff. You, there were two or three stories you can write right out of that alone. And that's not to say that you know the, the world revolves around feeding guys like you and I stories. But, uh, you know, frankly, if if the vendors have that tough a time spinning a relevant narrative to us, then I got to believe their sales organizations are really struggling trying to tell something new, interesting, and exciting to their prospects. And uh, that's going to be that that'll start showing up in their deal flow and pipeline in short order. Yeah, I, I guess I just I, I didn't want to just totally hammer, but but some hammering is appropriate here. But it's also just to put out a cry for creativity that the, there is possible for more creative opportunity here. The person I was talking to earlier today is actually a fairly, I would say, conservative individual, but he was saying that uh, vendors need to take more chances, need to, and the opportunity is there, and and the technology is not the weakness here. Granted, for large-scale virtual events, some of the technology is a work in progress, and I'm actually looking into some of these larger-scale event platforms right now for my series. Some of it's a work in progress, but the, the limitation on this is primarily imagination and is primarily about setting different goals for the event and realizing that when, mm -hmm. you create, when, you create, when you include people who want to be engaged right now and make them feel like there's a reason why they showed up for a live event instead of checking out the replays, give them some real interactivity, give them a chance to get their questions answered, meet new people, have birds of a feather gatherings, things like that. When you give them those opportunities, um, a lot of cool things happen. And we, you know, uh, I don't think, did you, did you make the, oh yeah, you made this one, right? The Sage and Tack, the, uh, the evening wine event. I was on that for a piece of it. Uh, I mean, it was just really neat. I never got around to it, but but since they never got around to you know letting me evaluate the the nose on this 2019 Dr Pepper I was drinking, I eventually had to bail. But yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It was just neat because it was just like, oh, let's let's taste some wine together that we shipped out. Um, you know, let's. Uh, I don't drink wine, so I wasn't a part of the tasting. <laughs> but 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 the 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 wine producer was on the call, and it, there was no not a there was no agenda behind it. It was just like let's get together. We miss seeing each other. This would be a fun thing to learn more about. And, uh, you know, I was like, wow, you know, you, you, left, you left that evening. You didn't know anything more about the company than you did before. But you better believe the next time they pick up the phone or email you, you know, I'm there. You know what I mean? Like, be, because they took that extra time. And so it's actually, it's not a platform limitation. It's, it's more of a, the art of the possible. And so hopefully what we're going to figure out here is that 
you know, yeah, everyone is hopeful that things can reopen and you can gradually get back to whatever we we're doing before. Who knows? We could have a long talk about whether that's ever going to happen. But in the meantime, let's not just treat this as a holding pattern. Let's make the most out of it. That would be my view. Let's, uh, let's bring this to a close. And if m- my thoughts on today's conversation, I think this is a challenging and changing time for a lot of older ERP vendors, for sure. I think there are some newer, newish kind of vendors and products who have um, architectures, business practices, and the like that are going to be able to really clean up in the short term. I do think there's work to be done in functionality here of that whether it's uh, signal changes in analytic and forecasting deals, whether it's more flexibility on the sales marketing side on terms and the like, and, 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 I mean, they're, they're literally, uh, they're, there's two days worth of ideas I could uh, unload on an ERP vendor about where the changes are needed, but regardless, it's a changing time. And that's, I think probably one of the big headlines I have from today's podcast. How about you, John? That works for me, Brian. I think you summed it up well. Let's end our pre-recorded session and see how <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and see, see how see how relevant it actually is in the ears of our listeners. And uh, the good thing about our listeners, Brian, is that if it if it is irrelevant, we're going to hear all about that too. So. Yeah, we do get a lot of real time feedback. Well, thanks for having me on again, John. Always a pleasure. And uh, stay safe and stay six feet away from whatever. And uh, I'm sure we'll talk again soon, or I'll see you on the next Zoom call with a vendor probably in the next week or um, anyway. Take care, John. If you manage to log in. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> there is that. Take care, Brian. <laughs>